Hola. Hola. Bueno, buenas tardes. Bienvenidos a este panel que tengo el... Welcome to this panel that I have the pleasure to lead. Sergio from La 33, people from Sulpelitio and Santiago Cruz. I am going to introduce them like they deserve, but I want to tell you a bit about who I am and the focus I'm going to give to this panel. My name is Daniel Alvarez. I am a business administrator, sound engineer, and musician. I direct Fonseca's office in Colombia, which is called Proyecto Nash. All Fonseca's music goes through my office, and I am a musician from a band called Diamante Eléctrico. I play on both bands, I, well, I could say, and I can know the pains from both sides. This panel and resonance in general and all the discussions that are so interesting within music nowadays exist for a reason, and that is because the cultural industry in general with the digital industry stopped to have to dictate trends or tastes, for example, what was the top 40 that used to rotate, 40 songs that used to rotate the full month, and we had or had to like it. That's what they dictated to us. In 2000, what happened? The last great record that was sold was Strings Attached from Sync. And the musical industry started to go downwards until it started to grow just a, on a decimal point last year. We're just refurbishing it. What is the focus of all this digital revolution? What does it do? It gives us a lot of tools and instruments to hand that these people use. And how do they use it? I don't want to use this panel as a revelation one. I, am, I want to start saying that uh, media don't make artists, not either digital or massive. It's a tool. I think for them as well. And the career of these three characters and their bands, where do they apply? They, did they do a pre, uh, digital revolution or are they outside? La 33 has gone out of the country more than 20 times, uh, nine times to Europe, uh, the, the States, four times, Mexico, Australia, Japan, Asia. And what did La 33 do? They sold 10,000 uh, records, 18,000 records from one to the other, and they had money. How did you do that? Selling records. So they don't vend. Their story is not exclusively dependent on digital media. They have two, 2004, 2007, 2013 uh, within normal cycles for their records. 26,000 followers in Twitter, uh, 2,122 follow them. Checho Mejia from 33 also has a Twitter, 963 followers. He follows 282 uh, people, and he had tweeted the last time at 9 o'clock in the morning. Superlitio is, is here on in our view, the, he has red boxes today. He, they were born in 1987. The digital revolution passed in 2000. It arrived in Colombia a little late. We like everything to arrive late. It's not that 2000 uh, revolutionized us as artists. No, we continued working. Superlitio was born in 1997. What about computers? Ah. So, so, in 2001, they were touring the states while this revolution was happening, all this was bursting a great presence in Los Angeles where many uh, things were happening during this 
stage of some much revolution. Five albums from the studio, Marciana, 1999, Tropic Tropicana, 2005. Then there were six years when musicians go mad, and then another one, and uh, another one in 2011. And then they have two uh, live called Ian Rebojo, one, and they have with so many followers on Twitter, and the last tweet this morning at 9 o'clock in the morning. He has 3,600, he followed 73, and he had tweeted a minute before. In YouTube, uh, 15,000 fans, thousands of views, uh, and Facebook's 139 likes with a lot of corporate activity, but very sustained. Santiago started to play in bars in 94. He is an artist with two faces. One mainstream underground for moving in a world uh, that is mainstream and for having singles like uh, ones that really broke through, but with the mentality, I will do my record as I want, I will discover myself musically. And then there's a crossroads, a, a very big label, uh, the songs on the radio, very sustained, and gold records. This is full mainstream. Nevertheless, Santiago's mentality is one that I would like to explore very much, because he is very much himself and the, the social media have allowed for this and studio uh, records the ones uh, once in 2006 2009 2012 and he has this called cruce caminos which is called uh, acoustic live is uh, almost a million lives in, in facebook almost a million in twitter, twitter and and he follows 800, uh, 268 people. And YouTube, the activity you see from them, Superlitio, the first results were their official videos. What the people most see are official videos, the most seen, 2.1 million views. And La 33 from Santiago, Santiago is, is up there because he has Vivo. But there are also many comments from fans, so that shows a lot what kind of fan there is and his involvement. I think he is very purist. Others go and uh, just download the video. It's another mentality. And what it interests us most is to listen to them. Where were you uh, on in the year 2000 as artists and music consumers. So who would like to throw himself to the water? Hello? Uh, we La Tentatres didn't exist yet. I had already had a trajectory as a musician with rock bands since the 90s. I played with one called Las Oronas y Fuegos which closed uh, Rock in the Park in the year 96 or 97. After that, I decided um, to leave the country. I was in Canada in 2000, studying music, English and French a bit. And I was coming back to Colombia after two years of living abroad. As a music consumer, were you uh, going into internet, uh, downloading or buying records? How were you as a consumer? No, I used to buy records. I was buying much more jazz than, and salsa as well. But yes, I did buy music. Good afternoon. As a musician, I was enjoying what I had found was a surprise with Superlitio. We had started a band without m many expectations, not in the bad sense. We were not very ambitious, really. We were not having fun with the band and with what we were experimenting. It also applies that we didn't know very well what we were doing. To, for an example, uh, whoever recorded uh, our first 
record it was somebody who knew how to use the bass and the, the all the music in the console so it was very innocent music the treble uh, as to producing music we were very naive because now that in Colombia there are people who have studied and know what they do we didn't have that so we learned like this so I was enjoying all this learning when Superlitio came out. There were many festivals in various cities. There was Rock in the Park, uh, the Festival of um, Clouds, and there were some events in, uh, in the, what is called La Media Torta, Carlos Vieco in Medellin. There were many events there. And we had the opportunity of working in those scenarios with people that were looking for Colombian bands, Colombian music. It wasn't very organized, but it was starting and I was really enjoying it. Thousands of people used to go. Our first Rock in the Park was in 98. And they made it difficult for us because we had to uh, perform after Robbie Raque Rosa, who had this song that was very popular. And then he was the maximum star of the festival Simo, at the park Simon Bolivar, 90,000 or so people. and. And then, and, and, and this person arrived, this artist with a veil on his face, and, so, and said, you should like darken the lights and just threw the scenario on us. And although we didn't play very well, what we did was that we jumped from the first to the last song, and suddenly people were sort, sort of uh, infected by this and they were we were enjoying this moment of knowing the public knowing the reaction because before with school friends they even criticized us so to see people that you don't know enjoying your music is amazing at that time although a girlfriend of mine had opened a, an email I think I hadn't opened it the first time I didn't consume or, or, or knew the potential. Only a year afterwards, all the digital media. And I used to buy records. I think that the, the majority of members of Superlutio did. Armandito uh, then became a professional downloader. But we all used to buy records and we used to pass them around to show things that we liked and it was that culture when the record was still something romantic. Then it became just like a pair of shoes or something like that, but still the record was very much alive. Uh, in 2000, a good afternoon, after various years of starting to play in bars, we had decided with a friend to open our own bar to play just what we, whatever we liked, not what the owner wanted, but what we did. And as a consumer, I have always been a good consumer of music. And since the bar used to be in Usaka, and I used to go to the shops of this mall, Hacienda Santa Barbara, to explore and see what there was there, what was arriving. And since I had this about the bar, apart from music live, I also had to offer people something different, uh, different from what people go to a bar to listen, to, to hear when they're drinking beer or a glass of wine, but things of my own liking. At that time I was writing songs in a very vague manner, not very strict as a composer and erroneously waiting for somebody to go to the bar and discover me and offer me a contract, waiting for this fairy tale of somebody coming in and offering a, a label contract and not looking for it. That was uh, what I was living in 2000. 
As I said, you had your own radio. You had something captive. Yes, at that time it was a small bar. It then grew. First it, it was for 80 people, then 120, then 500 that used to go every night. But evidently it was a captive audience. When I launched my first record, I remember that Warner launched it and then it closed three months afterwards. I hope it wasn't because of my record, but be, uh, for the uh, purchaser's decision. But I used to sell my records in the bar quite easily. 120 people every night. By the time I sold my record, about 500, 600 people every night. It was a very uh, easy instrument tool so that it, it could be invoiced with half a bottle of aguardiente at the bar, uh, taking profit of people's unconscious. It, it's a success. So you go with your part, your mo and then you, you buy, yes, we are the, the first ones, the first network that you opened, and with what expectation? It, it, was it the beginning of the end, or was it there just to be like in fashion, well, with my space, with the expectation that it would generate more visibility, traffic, but it didn't really work much. We also m um, made our, our web and we concentrated on that. MySpace, I think we were one of the first bands that opened MySpace because we were in the States and the label had an advertiser that was that knew it, we didn't know, and it show, he, she showed us how it, it worked and showed that people responded, so we saw the potential and went into it. And it happened. My space is yes. Uh, it seems like millions ago with social media, but it was my space, uh, the first network. Again, with uh, the expectation that somebody said, oh, look, this is uh, a very good w artist to be discovered there, more than to uh, disseminate uh, to the public. It was more like showing the industry it was the i think at that time that network was more for colleagues and people from the industry rather than common users so i opened it and really i think the most important that was left to me was my contact with nacho from spain i wrote to him from there and i had his answer through my space and he said, no idea. Yes, I had always had this dream to work with Nacho Magno. He is from Presuntos Implicados, this Spanish band which has such a fantastic aesthetic. And he has produced records from people I admire very much. So I had dreamt of working with him. And going into my space, I looked for his profile. I don't know whether it was his official one. And I said, Nacho, I am Santiago Cruz. I'm an author and, music and singer, Colombian. And you can listen to my music in my space. And I've always dreamt about making a record with you. So I sent the message to the air just to think what happened. And about a month later, he answered to me through my space. I saw the message in inbox. And I, I took a few minutes to open it. I didn't know what the answer was going to be. And eight months later, I was actually recording in Spain with him. So my link with my space and the success for me was connecting me with that producer. One of the things that st uh, studious people of societies from digital whatever call the, F the three Fs, friends, family, and fools. Uh, they, uh, with fools, they mean that, that friend that always buys anything you, you make, even if it's terrible. So what was the f your first song or product that came out of there? and surprised people around the corner. And what was the influence from social media in that process? 
I think that in our case it was the first record. La 33 was called uh, the La Pantera Mambo song, and we could see that social media really worked. We hadn't seen that uh, two or three months after launching the record. La Pantera Mambo, I, I wrote in Google Pantera Mambo, and it, and it came out in many places in the world, Spain, the United States, Argentina, Japan, then to see that music can travel at another speed, and it was a very pleasant surprise. We didn't invest any money for advertisement, but people were finding the record and sharing that, and it went very much uh, extending underground globally. It's very interesting that I worked uh, in uh, with La Tente Tres as an assistant engineer and with Mauricio Cano, he told me that, that through Audiovision, many records go through one of every 20, I would say. It, it, it figures, you can uh, call it whatever, that it, that it is recorded and after two years, and Mauricio asked it, the, um, how are you going to pay that? We sold 20,000 of those records. So it did not not only generate a taste, but a response. And that it, so we, we had to have to analyze what was their target and why did they sell it. They have sold about 60,000 records up to date. And that that was in 2004, to d today. I'm not saying from 89 to 99. This is a very interesting case to analyze. With Pipe, uh, I would have to divide before social media and Lay afterwards, I, as I told you before, the first record at that time, or Colombian bands, or Bogotano, uh, used to perform hardcore. There was a program here in Bogotá from Hector Mora, which what used to be called Señal Radio Nico was Radio Difusora Nacional. It used to be called Four Channels, and their focus was national rock. We arrived was that we were here in Bogotá. We used to live in Cali still, and our first record wasn't hardcore at all. The first song was like a funk disco with rap, S nothing to do with it, what was b being played at that time but with by Bogotano bands. And he was tired of receiving hardcore bands that day and they said no if you are hardcore I don't want to receive you and we said no just you know receive it play it he did it and he heard the first song called Urban 7 and he smiled and he said let's go on air it was number one in that program for seven weeks and it was the first time that we were in Bogota and we were somewhere and somebody played a, a, the ra a, a radio station and we heard us. And it was such a surprise to feel to hear somebody so underground as Super Lutio. And then after those that social media, we thought, what should we do? Because it had this display in the media. We were able to s get feedback from the social networks because social networks, they have that ability. You realize who you like, who likes you, what people like, what people don't like, and what's the most, the, the things that people like the most. So that's the way we got a feel of what the social networks were capable of doing. In my case, I'm not hardcore or anything like that. In my case, for example, I'm I want to talk about a song from the first record. And uh, Daniel mentioned that una y otra vez once and again, that's the name of the song. And that's a typical case of a song that came into the record at the last minute that we didn't have any more money to pay any more musicians. And that was the last time that was allocated to us in the, at the studio. And we put together that song, we recorded that song the night before we finished our studio time. And I told my studio officer, I told him, hey, this is what I came up with yesterday, last night, and I think we should record it. And that was a big surprise to us. That was the best song, the song that did the that had the best performance out there 
in the air from our first record. I didn't use any social networks by then. We had a MySpace page. I think I opened that back then. I opened that account, MySpace account back then. I can't recall. Actually, my first computer, actually, I bought it back in 2005. So that song, the money that came from that song, I used it to buy that computer. And that song was the first hit that we had. And for a long time, people knew us that way as the band that recorded that song. Okay, even though you didn't have knowledge of the social networks, do you have anyone checking that for you? Okay, we had MySpace and YouTube. We had a video that was posted into YouTube, and the video had me running all the time. It was ridiculous. All you did there was see a guy running. We didn't have an, a very good video. I was actually running. I wasn't running on a treadmill. I was running in different streets once and again, like the ne just like the name of the song. So it wasn't very well planned. And I am from Ibagué. That's a city two hours away from Bogota, Cristina Omaña, and Carolina Severo. They are models. They come from Eva Get too, and they helped us. And having these two beauties in the video, it also helped us. I don't know. I'm not sure why the video did that well, but I don't think that the video was that special. And we had a very big dis dissemination thanks to that video. So I think that back then, the networks, social networks, were not something that people used a lot back then. And I think that the most important thing here and something I want to highlight is the fact that the artist is not created by the social networks, by the network, by the web. I don't think the artist is created by strategies or community managers. I think the artist is created by the song. I think the quality of the song dictates how known you become. If you don't have that quality there, you're not going to be something, someone who is recognized. Talking about different networks, about different social media, and radio stations. I think they used to dictate what people listen to. Today, they have a big number of products waiting to be aired. So I think the networks change that. So uh, when you connect yourself to, the, to a web page or a web service, I think you choose what you're going to listen to. And what you listen to is going to dictate what the rest of the people, in a way, are going to listen to. So what do you think this social media is good for? To sell, to communicate? How do you perceive the different social networks? We have Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We have accounts there as well as YouTube, we have a channel there. Facebook, Facebook has worked a lot to improve our image. I think we use them to have a more direct communication with our fans, with our fan base, although we are not looking at these, not, not, not the same people is always looking at these. We are always changing so different members of the band are going to be looking at our accounts at different times so that's the way we have been trying to approach this what do you use youtube and twitter and facebook for youtube we use it to upload our videos i think we don't have a very big presence there we are just kicking off our channel as you said this channel is not very strong. Fans publish some videos there, but the videos that we have there don't have a lot of visits. 
too many. I think our uh, video, the one that has the most visits, has about 200,000 views. We use it to disseminate some of our information, our videos. There's a channel we're working on, but that's not very strong for us. Twitter is very good to give information out on concerts, on our trips, and to get more fans, to enhance our fan base. Superlitio has Facebook page, Twitter page, uh, video channel, Google Plus too, and you recently came up with an OK page. I think Facebook is the one that provides more functions to us. It has more capabilities. You can post videos, events, songs, all of these things in Facebook, and that's available there 24-7. If you post something there today, it is going to stay there, and the most that people like it or comment it, they stay the longest in our timeline. So a lot of people have a lot of friends, and when they like one of our videos, our video is exposed to those friends. So I think Facebook is the most comprehensive. It offers more things that are useful to us. It provides a lot of feedback from our fan base. We could also link to other networks like YouTube. On Facebook, we can promote events. We can promote, promote things. For example, a launch of a new record that could be done there on Facebook. Twitter is something that is more immediate, is quicker, and in our case, we have linked the two accounts, the Facebook and Twitter account. So whatever is published on Twitter, you have it on Facebook, and whatever is posted on Facebook, it's updated in Twitter too. It's something, it's a functionality that offers us a lot of advantages too. So, but I feel that Twitter gives you a better feeling of what the fans think. Some people have greater participation than others. They participate more. I have to clarify something. We use our networks from our offices. We do it from our offices, 60%, and the rest, I do it. So I want to be honest. I want to be clear about that. So we have some people in our office looking at these accounts most of the time because I am at the recording studio most of the time and I take a lot of pictures or videos and someone else is going to publish it most of the time. So Twitter it makes it easier for me to sometimes I publish things on Twitter, things that I consider are exclusive to that network. YouTube. It's also very important and for Superlitio, I think we have a lot of followers there of our channel. People like to watch our official videos, but I think that we have also tried to do something different. That's a policy. We want people to look at our video channel, at our YouTube channel. We have extra content there. For example, we have videos from our web webisodes that we produced back in 2008. Even though this was done by means of a magazine, a press, a printed magazine, most of that material was also posted in YouTube. We have also used YouTube to attract a lot of people when we have new launches and we're trying to expand our fan base there. In my case, we have an official web page. That's where we try to centralize all of our information. We have a subscription service where people subscribe to a newsletter. They get our press communications and all the updates that we post on our web page. We have Facebook, obviously. I consider that Facebook right now, I think that it's uh, very corporate the way we use Facebook. We talk about our concerts. We talk about the launch of videos. Twitter is also something that we use, but it's a little bit more personal. I use it to promote things, but it's a little bit more personal to me. Google Plus, I think I'm trying to work out how 
it has to be used still I'm not aware of the full potential of it but I know that it has a lot of potential because we have the people from Google behind it I know that it has a lot of potential but I haven't been able to work it out completely I, I'm not the one who manages our social networks I also have Instagram and I have something called kick that's a network that's very similar to Twitter. It has a limitation in terms of the characters that you can publish, but this is used to publish videos. You cannot upload anything that is greater than 36 seconds in length in terms of videos, so I'm trying to use Kik, but I haven't been able to record a video on Instagram. You have to keep your finger on the button. That's the way you record it, so that's very easy. Okay, th I'm going to try that. So Daniel was talking a little bit about the global artists and the niche artist. And I think that the strategy on my social networks, now you mentioned the word selling. I don't know how much they sell the social networks, but what I actually know is that they communicate and they allow feedback. And that's basically what you are looking for. We also want to sell, obviously, records and all other things, but I don't know how networks, or social network networks are going to enable monetizing our products. But I think our strategy in the networks is to target niches and try to expand our fan base, but I think we need to be careful about the way we expand. We need to make sure that we take care of our niche. I have a YouTube channel too. I have Bevo. It's a nightmare because it's not immediate. If you upload something into Vivo, you have to wait between f two weeks and a full month to have your material available worldwide. So besides Vivo, I have a dedicated channel in YouTube where I can upload more personal things. And what I'm doing, what I've been doing lately in my channel, Pio Cruz Video, is uploading things that we call carpentry, uh, which show our trials, we show our rehearsals, that's why we try to show that material we try to show and people in that way get a better feeling of what we do and how we achieve the music and the product that we come up with, that we launch. So what we try to do is produce content to keep our niche happy. That's what we think is most valuable in terms of handling our social networks. When Santiago says he doesn't know how much you can sell through the networks, I think I agree with him. I think what you have to do there is promote and see what you sell. I think that, in fact, the latest single that we launched, we launched it because we got some feedback from our fan base. So we launched it back in July 17th last year. So I asked the people, what single do you want us to launch after the first one? So we had already launched three singles, but we wanted to see what other song people wanted us to launch from our latest record. So uh, that in that way, I think the networks are very useful. That kind of questions work very well in the social networks. What song do you like from the record? What song do you like the best from our band? I think networks are a very big challenge, a beautiful challenge. We need to understand them, and we need to use them to act too. Some bands, for example, they like to ask, what do you want our next single to be? And sometimes you don't get an answer, but I think that's a, a good way to get feedback. I think the social networks, this kind of innovations, when you're trying to change the status quo and I think networks could be used to generate more sales, but I think the bigger bands are going to be able to do that, but the newer bands are not going to be able to do, that, to do this. I think we have to use the networks 
to get participation from the fans and that's why you have to generate first and then look at the sales sales will come after people they want to communicate so the social network is not a strategy itself is not a tactic it's a means that we can use to get more participation from the fan base and that issue related to the social networks I think that the person who is trying to use them they need to be authentic even if you are an, arti an artist or uh, an individual you talked about the bigger bands the bands that are very well known so the people they use the stop motion to produce uh, a very nice video then the, the other bands they tried to do it and they were trying to replicate what Super Litio did and then I think your band used another tool to produce a video Robin Thicke he produced a video where he was showing a lot of tits from girls and whoever comes after Robin Thicke doing that is going to be replicating what he already did but I what I'm trying to say is that you have to be authentic you have to look at what your identity is and try to keep it that's what you have to do with an artist you have to be authentic and being authentic is related to all of this and you are walking on a very narrow path when you're trying to be authentic sometimes you follow a different path you fall off your path and you lose your ideas but you have to get back to them you have to be authentic I read about managing networks and that article that I read mentioned that many of us look at authenticity and that's the band's responsibility we need to talk to you to our audience as if you were selling something and even when you tr even when you do that you have to make sure that you that it doesn't sound like you are selling so I think that your audience has to be treated like you say you have to be honest when you approach them you have to be authentic if you don't have a community manager you have to tell them you don't have a community manager and if you do you have to tell them I think that musicians and I think uh, excuse me if I'm being too cold if you have a pair of shoes staying on the stands there you can sell them after two months but uh, if you're a musician you cannot do that you have to approach your audience sometimes you think of very complex strategies you take two months to implement them but if you don't have a clear objective I think you are just wasting time when HTML5 came out English Fire they came out with a very good video in Google they generated a lot of sales but I think that every, all the efforts that you put together on the social networks you have to have a clear objective for them I think that we're going into the Q&A session we don't have any more time I think I think that the most expensive that you think that you can do for a social network is the production of a video what's your opinion because a Twitter, a Twitter message is free a banner for Facebook is about a minimum wage a month but the video is very expensive out of it and a video you're going to post it only on Facebook if you have Vivo you are going to have your video always showing on the first few spots of a search result so what's your opinion about videos spending money on videos to be posted on YouTube basically we have uh, all the time we produce a video a video clip we also try to produce a small documentary on the band the way we came up with a video and we try to produce more material related to it at the beginning we had a person dedicated to manage that kind of content from the band all the time and he used to compile material but the video clips that came after that 
we have produced them because some other people came with the idea and they came up with the resources. But I think that most of our video clips came out because we had some other people, outside people, interested in them. Our biggest interest when we produce a video clip, uh, we want to make sure that the idea is going to ca catch the eye of many people. Now when you talk about resources, money, some ideas are expensive and that makes them more complicated. We, even if we have people working for free, there are some costs, expensive expenses that we have to cover. So we don't care. Not all of our singles have to be accompanied by uh, videos. So the, when we do want a video to accompany uh, the launch of a single, we make sure that the ideas are good enough and that we can cover expenses or costs. But I always try to choose the ideas that are very good and that are not necessarily very expensive. That's the way we approach them. There is a way that Superlitius management has adopted and this was a very effective way of doing things. Every time we launched something that was given out for free, our we used to tell people that it was for free, but the only thing that you have to give us was your email address and your contact information, your particulars, and that's very useful. Even though you're giving away your material, you're going to get a very big mailing list. And for the case of Telastime, that's a song that people told us was the song they wanted to hear from our latest record because we played it on a on a radio station, uh, in a radio station, and people, after that, they told us that they wanted us to launch that. People enjoyed it a lot. So that was a message that we got from our fan base. We decided then that this song needed a very good video. We talked to Fernando Lopez, and we produced it. Our management told us, hey, why don't we do this? Let's let's not give the exclusive to a radio station or a news program. Why don't we use our mail list and send it to the people? So we waited for two days, and the response was impressive. Everyone who got the link of the video, they posted that video into their Facebook page, and that multiplied the views of the video even before we went out. We launched it in a TV station. We had a big dissemination, so that was the way we approached that, the launch of that song. To me, video is a tool that is of the utmost important to disseminate any musical project. Whatever the budget you have, that's something that you need to consider. The important thing here is the idea behind the video, the idea that we are going to introduce in the video. So I have gone through different stages. I have gone, I have worked with TV stations that want to produce our videos, but after the production I have to send letters so the video is not aired because the, res the end result was not very good in Argentina. We also had a problem. I don't want to talk about that, but I now understand that we need to be honest. I, I'm going to talk about authenticity here again. I think that the artist should feel comfortable when you tape a video. Uh, the most comfortable I felt while producing a video was when I produced the video for our third song. Now we produced a video a few months ago and we're using images from our tour and I felt very comfortable there too. The video is showing me the way I am, where I'm more comfortable at the recording studio. That's where I feel most comfortable and I think that people are going to see that and I'm going to have better feedback. I want to talk about a video that we recorded in Buenos Aires with uh, choreography, a lot of dancers, something that we try to do a little bit more elaborate and it has 
600,000 views by videos with images from uh, the studio time with the producer with the consoles microphones and it has over 10 million views so I think that honesty that authenticity that people feel when they look at the video is because I also feel it and that's the video I like the most that's going to be translated into more views and people are going to like it more and I think that's a, a very important tool to have a video support on your for your songs uh, either if it is a video lyrics a concert or you sitting in your living room I think you need to be authentic you have to be clear about the message you want to convey now let's go to the Q on A who has a question? Okay, it's, my question is not related to the networks, but what's your policy? I work for Enter that go we have follow Spotify this all the, the, the pro all the issues that they have. Do you have your songs posted on Spotify? There is big talk about artists not getting the revenue they should be getting. People are complaining about that. There is no revenue being generated for the artists. And what do you think about the existence of this kind of media in the music industry? I'm going to use a few seconds there. I don't think that any of the three products here, as Daniel just called us, I don't think we were present in the wave where big physical sales were a reality so we had to go from not getting paid at all to getting paid a little bit even if it's not ideal and I think that's progress to us so I think that thanks to those tools the issue of illegal downloading and piracy I think it has been reduced I don't have indicators uh, I don't have that kind of data unfortunately but uh, I feel that we went from not having anything at all to having something and that's progress that's moving forward my music is in diesel Spotify, Spotify Pandora I don't know how many and I say fortunately because people have access to it it could be better possibly but people wonder where to be compensated so again we move from something that is extremely illegal to something that has been established properly and that is properly recognized so my product is also in diesel Spotify I'm quite new in diesel and I'm also discovering that there is people who can follow my musical taste in diesel and I think that that is a very good symptom that it could turn into a social network too but I still have to work on it I'm happy because I see that Super Litio's music is all available in diesel all our music is not very easily available uh, Tropicana is a record that uh, is a very good record for us and we cannot sell it again and uh, having this music available in diesel on iTunes I think that's a big advantage for us to us all these things related to free downloading is something that we don't have a clear opinion about I don't I'm not sure what position I have within the band actually we have discussed this a lot and we don't know what to feel or say but to me have our music disseminated by this means is very important and after that we can have a lot of opinions about it but that's the main thing I agree with what you say we are just going into this on Spotify and we're gener generating some revenue we're generating some revenue so I like this a lot I'm an ambassador I love the platform that Tigo offers to that's uh, not 
a mobile operator carrier. I have a big relationship with them, but now that Pipe mentions this, that's a very important mix of a social network and a radio station. People are able to follow your taste, your musical taste. People can see what you listen to. And there are also indicators, you know, what your most popular song on diesel is. And that's very valuable to get that sort of feedback for us as an artist that's very important. Can I say a small thing before we finish? Now that you mentioned this, to us, we are just discovering some things, but if there is a member of a band or a manager here, I will tell this person, I would like to tell this person, to have all your band members to spend some time investigating how these networks work. Because, as you just said, you can see a lot of detail for all your songs and how they work on your favor. If you delegate this kind of thing, I think you are going to maybe not be able to analyze the information or you're losing the opportunity of contacting your fans, having interaction with them. I am Nicolas, I am a member of Pupaphonic, that's a band. We have done this through social media and digital platforms. We do it ourselves within our band, these type of matters. And I want to ta we take from the this question that Pipe is mentioning, from the particular cases of each one of you, your experiences. What has been the method you have employed with your respective bands to find the voice with which you speak to your fans, followers, spectators so that be the most effective possible and may redound in, in engagements, downloads, growth of networks and all these uh, social media we are managing to nowadays. In my case, obviously, it is different because it's my voice. But I think that everything has to do with authenticity and you knowing who you are. Corporately, we are taught that the com company has to have a mission and a vision. And I think that, that artistically, the same happens. You have to have very clear who you are and what you ha want to deliver to people. So in that sense, you may address your communication to that. But if you don't have very clear what type of artist you are, the communication is going to very di be very difficult to convey. So the sole fundamental success factor is for the messages to be clear for people. And it has to come pr clear from the origin. In the case of a band, it's different. People and as you will say it, how do you join the different voices to be only one? But we know what that thing that has sounds like and Superlitio as well. And the message will arrive like they too sound. Well, Santiago is right when there are various voices, including the office, which also manages in a great percentage Superlitio. And like you said, uh, wh what you saw about the publications, the last thing we published was very corporate. That's the, the office putting their hands in there. But somebody told me the other day that they noticed when it was us who published and not the office. But I say, first of all, to suit whatever you like. For example, you can publish something very simple like a, a photograph or Santiago says or doing something like carpentry because he likes it, what he does during the weather, when they're rehearsing, and you can start from there. And there are also aids, for example, when you know the discourse, the, the concept from your album. For example, 
we uh, if we are in Medellin, we, 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 we write down the lunada arrived in Medellin, like the moon night arrived in Medellin. Uh, with your own lingo, your own language. I think those aids are very useful. The first thing I would uh, try to do, and very useful if you are a band, for example, speaking about Facebook, is to accumulate likes. That's very useful, as I said, because if you publish something, as I say, that is going to generate likes and comments, that is going to put uh, in Facebook's timeline, uh, people that have friends and followers in Facebook will bring more new people curious about what your band is doing. From little I know, I, I can say that. In our case, we have 12 points of view, so that's uh, rather complex, but we have found the way with a community manager that also speaks everyone's language. Some don't speak the band's language. It's not, when they publish it, not so much that the fan says they don't like it, but when the band says, no, we don't like the way you are communicating, we're not saying what we want to say. On the other hand, we have a ch chat also to discuss what the kind of things we want to say, and we have had meanings to define that. Because being 12 is difficult to, to uh, arrive to solutions. Uh, we have points in common, and we try to communicate what we all share. I have two cases, Diamante Electrico, and then the second one for Seco. In the case of Diamante Electrico, we had the advantage of beginning at odds within all this music game with a new premise, and it was honesty. We had honesty by default because whoever is in front of the social media is Juan Galliano. He tweets, tweets like, like a, a, a very like a, a, a street person. And in Diamante Electrico in Santiago, I follow Fonseca, Santiago. I see how they communicate with them. Is that people answer in the language you speak? I see children who are angry, but. If we speak angrily, they replicate in the same language. It's interesting. Santiago, they take very much like his his wave, his kind of sound with the tweets that transcend uh, from the product. They answer in the same sound. And at, in the case of Funke Seca, it, it, only he manages his tweets. So uh, we learned how to express in his way. There are very specific things. I'm going to be very, I, I like to, to always open uh, exclamations in the beginning at the end, like you do in the Spanish language. But he does it only with exclamations at the end, with many, and uh, be, because that's the way he speaks. And he does many, all the copies go through him. And even then, we don't try to tell people in Facebook. This is not. Uh, media for like loving things. No, we are, we say we are the web team. And Carolina Rueda down in the back there, she brought that web concept to Fonseca. We speak the Fonseca's language and we also save ourselves saying Fonseca wasn't before the computer. And people see a benefit, see a benefit with that. And they, I, they like that honesty. We have space for one question. There has been a lot of polemic uh, in Facebook as to the algorithm when we publish. They don't. The, it only publishes a certain part of the databases. Have you gone through the Facebook ads to be able to reach all your followers? With what result? Have you invested strongly, or haven't you done it? That's my question. Well, the truth is, is that here I, I, I would like to like discover myself as not expert in social media, I don't know about algorithms and the message not arriving. Personally, I haven't uh, used Facebook apps, but I know that Sony Music, my label, with reference to my product, has done it. Uh, 
certain time when we were going to make a show in Mexico. There was an investment in Facebook ads when we were going to launch a product here in Andes, in Ecuador, Peru, Venezuela. There has been a direct investment in Facebook ads uh, in those markets. In my case, we have used it. I think that with much success because it arrives to the people that it should. Some people are excited because we are playing in Mexico. Other people couldn't care less because they're not there. So it's good for it to arrive directly to, to whoever it is. Uh, yes, I think we have also used Facebook ads. And we th I think it's very successful. One immediately feels that the investment is worth it. What uh, it would have to learn what is being promoted, because not everything is worthwhile to, to do through Facebook, but I would recommend it, yes. We haven't used it yet. We are uh, doing that study. Uh, I think it should work, uh, but I cannot say anything yet. I think with that, we are finishing the conclusion from the panel, which is this is not uh, black magic or any voodoo strategies behind the users of any of these twi Twitters or Facebooks. We were speaking about that a bit in the back. We are living in a world where social media are very important, but they are not the real world. For us, the real world is in the stage before the public on the stage, and that is the real defense of a product on the stage before people, not through the computer, of course, they are very valid tools and they have served us and benefited us, but without a song, without a message, and without communication of the real scenario before the public, the social media are not going to have any transcendence at all. To contribute a bit to that, in the back we used to say, don't believe too much in the success of social media. If you were going to make an event and 800,000 people were coming, don't, don't believe it, they're not coming. The, careful with those thousand friends. If you decide to go as artists into social media, you are already participating, they're going to see you, see your ciphers, your, your numbers, sorry. And if they don't go in, it's all right. If you say, I'm not going to go into Twitter because I don't want followers, but if you're going to participate, we'll do it. It's like playing from your back. But if you're going to be there, be honest and be very updated and very fit about your social media. Thank you.